Well, um, I've been working on this sermon for three months. That's really slow cooking, right? Three months. Uh, since God began to reveal a scripture to me. And I'm the kind of person when I get a hold of a scripture, I long let it go. I just look in, and I turn the page until my Bible is worn out on that page. Because I believe there is something there for me. We don't need the whole word of God. I mean, we do. But one little piece of it can change our life forever. And if we can find that piece, it's like that pearl that Jesus talks about. If we can find that pearl, it has great price. And you could sell everything you have or whatever you, just to, to have that connection with your Heavenly Father. Now I brought uh, my toolbox. My wife said, no, it's a money box. Well, my, all my toolbox were full, so I said, well, I'll use a money box. Uh, because I'm going to try this thing, okay? Because I, I got lots of stuff. I need my hand. So just bear with me. Do you have any faith? Okay, can we hear? Oh, yeah? All right, that's awesome. Bianca, you did awesome. Uh, at the end, because before I start, I see the end. Remember, you keep on the finish line. You know that song yet? Morning? Just a pain. So when I call you, all the worship people over here, you don't need a, a, a call. When I call Bianca, everybody back here, we're going to do that song, we're going to finish. Okay, so I don't need this. Okay. So okay. We'll start. I got a paid. But really, in the spirit, I've got 40 pages. So you're only going to hear pieces and bit. But it's going to affect you. Hear that? If you don't have the tools, you cannot get the job done. And basically, that's the, the, my sermon type. I don't know if it's a teaching, it's a preaching, or it's a, it's a talk, or whatever. If you don't have tools, Cannot get the job done. How many can agree with? It? And maybe you are, you are, you work in. A, maybe you're in a, an hairdresser. You don't have them scissors and all the fancy stuff. And you know what? You cannot get the job done. I don't care if you got a thousand customers. You know, and if you. You're a man and, and you work, you're a plumber, and, and if you don't have a cool box, you're smart and everything, but you cannot get the job done. And you know what, lady, if you're in the kitchen and you want to bake your husband this fabulous pie that he loves, and you don't have eggs, you don't have the flour, you cannot get the job done. And you know, if you're a teenager and you go to school and you haven't got the laptop, the uh, I, I what? iPad, you know, and the, the iMacs and all the I, you know, because you're at school, you're in grade 10 or in grade 11, you need the best. You cannot get the job done. And I brought this because I want to relate with my life your life. 
When I say my life, my wife and I, we're one. Okay, we've been one for 40 some years. Goodness, exactly, I could be wrong, but. <laughs> so, do we understand that thing that I say today? Without this toolbox, whatever you, you, you're doing with, okay, your life, whatever it is, you can't do something, do it. You haven't got the tool, you haven't got the paint, you haven't got the whatever it is. So this is very important. But the scripture that they discover a few months ago, I'm going to give you the scripture because we want to go to the word of God. How many want God? Okay. It's Luke 4, verse 18. And I was reading about Jesus. And you know, Jesus is, is, is awesome and he, he says this. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know, everything Jesus has, I don't want. Everything that he does, I kind of want to do. It's like when I look at him, he is my example. When I look at Jesus, he is everything. So he says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now listen to me, this scripture was in the book of Isaiah about 700 and some years before, locked in the book of Isaiah. Nobody used this scripture because it didn't belong to anybody. It belonged to Jesus. Amazing. So what he done? I brought a copy of the book of Isaiah here. Scroll. Right? I mean, maybe it's a little bit. But you can see, written in Hebrew. Can't read it, right? Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And you know, uh, other scripture says the meek. Other people humble. And I believe it's trying to say, preach the gospel to those who want to hear the gospel. Some people don't want to hear the gospel. Don't waste time. Pray that the Holy Spirit will begin to work in their life. You got to desire something. You got to desire to be like Jesus. You got to desire to do the work that He's done. So He sent me to announce release to the captive. And He says, the recovery of the sight of the blind. And I always thought it was a was a literal sign. Now I start to understand that it's just physical sign. Somebody that no one is or can't see. set free those who are oppressed. That's my Jesus. He come on the scene like Superman. Whatever the problem is, he can handle. Why? Because he has tool that he needs for the job. And you know what? As you look at Jesus' life and you look at all his tool that he uses, you wonder. Sometimes he uses the word. Sometimes he uses spit. Sometimes he says, you know, he touched them. Sometimes he speaks the word to them. And you know, every tool that he used hit the mark with everybody. I want to be like that. I don't want my word to fall on the ground, but I want to aim them direct. 
So God had to do a work in our life. You know, I'm not even going to my note. But anyway. And when we left here, we went to Colburn. Maybe some of them. I don't know. We, uh, my wife and I went there and we didn't really want to go there, but there was a call. There was something that was pulling us. So we did. Leonard and Sylvia, they came after. They had the desire to pass the church. So for a year, a year and a half, we trained. We worked with them. They worked with us. We did things together. And then one day, told people were leaving. Hey, you pick them, they're trained, they're ready. And you know what, church? It's been three, four months now. They're working at it. Any things are changing even more. I mean, you could tell it was God's will, not man. But in the process of time, we uh, met a man in Montreal, a French guy, and his wife. And he said, come and visit us in Montreal. So we said, okay, we'll take a weekend. We went to visit. And what the man dealt with is the heart of the people. The heart of the people. Well, I know a lot about the mind of the people. Right, Pierre? I, I'm logically uh, this computer, and this is yes, this is no, and all that stuff. But about the heart. Uh, didn't know too much about that. So I began to listen to him. He didn't talk much about the heart, but we just, for two days, I never seen somebody with so much truth. There was no secret about him. No secret about his life, his sin that he committed in the past. No secret about anything there was uh, about his finance, about where he's going and what he's doing. Said I never seen somebody so pure. What you say? And and he kept saying, "Well, you know, your heart has." And we live in a society. Where's my prop go? Upset. Okay. We live in a society where truthfulness is not always there. And you know what? That board that's going through there right now, you put your name on there. And you're going to be here when it's because honesty is part of your life. That's a tool. See, there are many tools in that box, and I will show you some if I ever get. I don't know what time it is. Remember, I got three months of stuff, right? <laughs> and you know, you put your name there. And it doesn't matter if you have to go to work. You tell your boss, listen, I've got a commitment. That's truth. I put my name there. Didn't even know my mother-in-law shows up. Sure, I'm going for sure. Or, or somebody very important. Golf game. Or, listen, my name is there. Find it. I'm going to meet there. And you know what? If we can be truthful in those small ways in our life and not get away from it, then we have gathered a tool that uh, Jesus can use so we can help him. Because remember, he's not here anymore. He's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. That's where he is. And he makes intercession for us, praying for us, and he's praying that we would take this toolbox that, and all the stuff that we gather over the years. Some of this stuff is not good that I haven't. I've got this I found in the shed. I don't think I could use that 100 years, but I still have it. Maybe somebody can use it. Uh, you can have it after. 
But what I'm saying to you is this thing in my life that's not going to help building God. But God begin to work in our life. Begin to work in our marriage. When he knows marriage is some work. He begin to work in in our heart, in our mind. You know that maybe I should say that I got it on my nose here. There's only three kind of marriage. And you're part of it, Mary. First one is you endure. You endure. Meaning, you've been married for 20 years and you know he's doing this and she's doing this and uh, maybe 40 years. Hey, you're going to have 50 years of endurance. You don't say that. <laughs> because he's got a problem with anger and she's got a problem with control, but we stay together because of the kids. We endure. The next one is escape. Now, a lot of people sometimes, how many know escape is great? 50% of the world escape married, go for a divorce. Did you know what? The statistic is the same church, 50%. 50% they Escape, because there's no other way. We're talking about the heart today. We're talking about the nitty gritty of your life, my life. And you know, it's not that we had a bad marriage. Uh, you know, my, I'm very independent. I came to Ontario, did my thing, I got married, I kept my independence. How many knows? Not good. When you get united with a good woman, awesome, and Still, and now you can't nudge your husband when I say those things because I see it. <laughs> Got to be very calm and listen. And uh, the last one is enjoy. That is what Jesus wants us to do with our marriage. Enjoy it. But we began to say to ourselves, okay, well, we got a few things here we got to iron out in our life. And I, I, yeah, I'm in the. See, a wife only needs three things. Well, maybe she'll get by with And you know, I'm not a marriage counselor in any way. But I had to apply this in my life. That's why I remember. He needs to be loved. Woman needs to be loved needs tech. And those are the two things. If you can give your wife that, she will be happy. With a credit card, yes. <laughs> right. Okay, now forget the last one. <laughs> so we, be we began over the period of a few months ago. What does my like, my like, my heart? What does my heart look like? And you know, I asked that question to people. Last week, a lady came to visit us. And uh, I asked, but well, my wife said, well, how's your heart? Tell me how you are. I usually ask that. No, the, I went to the doctor not that long ago, and he, he was asking me, uh, uh, what do you do? I just about said I'm an art specialist. Right? And, and she said, she said, uh, it feels like it was ran over by a little big steamroller. That's her heart. That's the core of is completely destroyed inside. I mean, you got to pull this and that, and you got to look for spatula to 
take it off the floor because that's how damaged he is. We're supposed to be anointed, preach the gospel, to have the answer for those who have a broken heart. And for years, because you have to remember, we were raised in the word of faith. The word is everything. Never talk much about, never talk much about the emotion. But it talks about the will. Never talk much about a broken heart. Never talk much. There's a lot of people out there, you know, that are broken. And they're sitting here. For some reason, you haven't got fixed. And I'm saying to you today that church could be the one that fixed. Because we got the calling. We see Jesus and what Jesus said there. It was only unlocking that scripture so that we can go back to the book of Isaiah and read it for ourselves and say, this is for me. See, Jesus, when he said this in Luke chapter 4, he had just got baptized. He came out of the water. The Bible says, oh. Of the Holy Spirit. That scripture did not unlock his ministry. It's already full of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes into the wilderness, and when he gets to the wilderness for 40 days, it says he came out of there full of the power of the Holy Spirit. The guy is charged, the guy is anointed. He's reading the scripture just to. Classify it once for all. That's done. Move. Let's go to the next. And to say that whoever reads the scripture can go back to Isaiah and it belongs to them. Isaiah 1 belongs to me. So I'm going to do everything in my power to have the tool that I have, that I need. Because when somebody comes to me at 100% depressed and they, they are not functioning anymore, the depression level is, the pain is so high, they cannot function. And as a pastor, well, you read your Bible today. That's not the answer. I mean, it isn't one answer. But you have to deal with the pain, with the hurt. And then he can function again. No, I want to tell you one thing. One guy came to me one time. And he says, Pastor, I'm having a problem with porno. And he's honest with me. He's honest. He's telling me the truth. But I don't know what to tell him. Because he's telling me something about his heart. And at me, I figured out in my head that's not connecting. And you know, it's sad to say that it was a long road for him. But you know what? I'm not going to do that. Because you know now, I know that I'm anointed. My wife is anointed for the work of the ministry. See, you don't have to be a pastor. How many knows if you're a police officer, no police officer here today? Okay. Good. Talk about it. <laughs> if you're a police officer and you're here, we, we got a jumper on, on 13th Street. You know what a jumper is? Somebody that wants to jump off the building. Somebody that's depressed. So depressed. Nothing else is worth living. So what do they do? Do they bring the machine gun and the gun and all that stuff? No, they call Maggie. Who's Maggie? Well, I'll just give some. Maggie, she, the heart special force. People talk to her. 
And she can connect with the heart of that person. Because most of us would say, you're crazy to jump. You know, you're going to go right to hell. And, and we quote the, the scripture. But Maggie comes. She can feel the pain. She can feel the hurt. And she goes right to the heart. Well, Jesus says, I need more Maggie. More people. They can forget about you. See, in this thing, I got some tool, and I got some things here that is it's not needed in my life. This is not going to help you. If I'm going to take this tool, kit, to go there and to help people, and if my anger rise up at a certain level, you know, every week, and I don't deal with stuff. That's stuff that I have in my life, that I have in my toolbox, but I don't deal with it. It stays there, and you know what? Big deal. It's a big deal for you. And it's a little deal for the one who needs you right now. Because somebody that's hurting, and you know what? You have never dealt with your control issue. You never dealt with your anger. You never dealt with your pride. So you get a toolbox full of things that not really good. Sorry, Dad, I can't help you. After all, you marry her, you stay with her. That's another tool that you shouldn't have in your toolbox. They know that. They want the marriage that they can enjoy. How do they get there? So that's what God called you. He called you to be smarter than the people out there. Because you got the word of God, you can take this word, change yourself, and change the world. And people will come to you, say, you got the answer. I like you. You're not condemning me. Condem You're not condemning me. You love me. You feel my pain. You know, in this toolbox, there's a lot of stuff. I probably never see what there is. I got, I got, um, I got a toy. Toys, yes. Uh, okay, there. I got a. This is a an heart attack. And what it does is, you hear that? When I get close to somebody's pain, the tool that I, I can feel his pain. His pain? But yet he said he's a strong guy. He said he's a really good guy. Pain. How you speak? Isn't it? And I'm just picking on you because usually, People sit at the front, but now they, everybody sit behind. So, so I'm going to the second row now. So next time, get to the third. <laughs> Let's read Isaiah. Um, I shouldn't. How, how much time do I have? Because, uh, oh my golly, I still okay. I do have another page. I didn't tell you. Um, so God is calling us to get our life in order each one of us now maybe you're not married that's fine maybe you got issue you know uh, maybe you have all kinds of problems and, and you know you're really uh, care of everything this fear there whatever I says, I want to take that stuff out of your life. I want to put fear in. Hey, I'm just checking. Because last time you checked me, I was this sleep. That was true, by the way. <laughs> Let's. 
let's look at some uh, tools. Um, get rid of tools that we don't need. Put that there. Now I'm not picking at anybody. Okay, it's the pastor. We love you. See that? Uh, okay. Sometime in your toolbox, you got too much, too busy. And that's something you have to get out of your toolbox. Too busy. What's that busy thing you say usually? I know. Because you never know when God will bring somebody with a broken heart in your life. You could be the last person that they talk to before they jump the bridge. You don't know that. But you know, hard. Well, you know, I, I got to cut my hair. I got to take care of my cows. I got to do, I'm picking on you the, okay, father, now you're a dad. And you're too busy. We have to answer to the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, as we clean our life, we become more sensitive to him. In my marriage, how's I, well, as I clean my life, I'm beginning to be more sensitive to my wife. Loves it. Or maybe I talk too much. You talk so much, you never hear what they say. And you know what? You got to get rid of that in your toolbox. You got to deal with my talking too much. Because if somebody gives me one little space, I take the hold. And maybe that's, that's you. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's your integrity level. Do that with me, Father. Work on my one at a time. Because there's I'm about six years old, maybe a little more, right? I don't want to tell my wife's age, so I, I just say hello. You gather a lot of junk over 60. And you know what? I, I've been thinking this morning. Sometimes I use this, right? Okay. There's people that gather a lot of stuff. Now, nobody said any word, nobody nudged anybody here. They're like junk collector. And they gather stuff everywhere and everything. And, uh, you know, they go in their, their house and in, in the garage. And, 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 you know, stuff, 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 stuff. Sometimes it can be like that. But we can gather stuff, stuff that we will never use to help this one. Because if I'm sent to help the broken heart, they are broken, and it's not because I thought it was only, it was only talking about the physical before. And you know what? Anointing, uh, we can talk a, a lot about the anointing. Remember when we went to Cuba a couple of years ago, and we were at Pastor Jock Church. And he's, he's sitting here, and I'm right here, and people are coming, and the anointing that was there. I look at him, he's bawling at the front. He's just, you know, he's not helping. He's just bawling there. And I got a translator, and it seemed like people are coming, and they're just moving. And, and the anointing, that's the only anointing that I knew. Physical. Hey, God is moving. Touching life. Everybody that came left. It was here. And you know, I, I, it feels good when the presence of God is on you and then inside you, Superman. And now they got Superwoman, right? What was the name of that girl you like? Wonder Woman. No, no. One, Travis. Used to like Wonder Woman when he was that tall. He had the cape and everything, and he run all over the place. He was seven years old, right? 
Am I lying or what? Telling the truth. <laughs> okay. Well. And you know what? It feels good when the anointing is on. And sometimes maybe uh, we come to a, a non-denominational church. It's all about physical healing. It's about the anointing. And it's great. I love the anointing. But it's an anointing that you have to work to keep and to get. Because it's dealing with you. And it's dealing with things in your life. And it's dealing with tools that you've gathered and, and you don't need. And, and it's no good for anybody. Not even good for you. You know what? We say, well, I can't throw this thing away. I might need it. Right? I said, no, I'll throw it away. The next day you need it. Right? How many can say amen to that? All right. But in the spirit, we can't do that. If God is dealing with your life, he's dealing with your things, it's because he's asked greater things for you. My God is awesome. So, I've got a lot to say, but I want to I wanna finish it. Because how many knows that you need some tool? Not just to go to work tomorrow, but you need some tool to help you. I didn't know that. Until I begin to look at the heart. Because everything that is talking about here is about the heart. To heal the broken heart. To, to proclaim liberty to the captive. And people are captive of their life, their thought, their marriage, you name it. They're fully captive and they're blinded. And to set at liberty those who are open. Now, in November, we went to Cuba again. Same church. The anointing is not there. Right after you got, you got uh, your accident. I'm not blaming you now, but I go there, no anointing. I figure I'm going to go there, and you know, you step there, and the anointing comes on you, nothing. You feel pretty deep. You have faith, and you know, they brought to me a blind man. He probably was about faith. And I had the, I did a mistake to look into his eyes. And I looked in his eyes, I saw nothing. I saw his eyeball. But I didn't see any life. I mean, he is physically blind. He cannot see. And you know, after I looked in his eyes, I don't know what kind of prayer I pray. Maybe I, I don't know. But all I know is there was nothing inside for him. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus has something for everybody. I don't care how bad somebody made you feel for 20 years. I don't care how bruised and how damaged somebody done to you, you're going to have to get to the place where you face the music and say, Lord, he has anointed me. Now, I like the Amplified Translation. It says, the Lord has commissioned me. Commission. It's not a if or but, it's not a maybe. He has commissioned me. Now, the Amplified Classic, did you know there was an Amplified Classic? It says that the Lord has qualified me. Qualify me, he will qualify you. I am not more smarter than you are, not more anointed than you are but I look at this that the Lord has qualified me to do his job that's heavy that's big 
That's why sometimes you, Lord, why don't you pick him? Yeah, I like him. Why don't you pick him? Give him my responsibility. Put that on him. You pick her. Come on, God. No, when you see the scripture and it becomes real to you, he has picked you. And when he has picked you, you have to understand that now you qualify. We don't want to do the Moses thing. Then him. We don't want to see the, we don't want to do the Jonah thing. Jonah said, no, no, nobody's going. I'm going. The other way. It's just there's so much cleaning up in our own life that says, no, no, not good enough. I don't speak very well. I'm not really a people person. And, you know, we get to the place where talk ourselves out of it, out of what he wants us to be. I want to finish this today. Yes, got it. I'm fine. Um, so the tools that we need to, to have in this toolbox, we have to begin to care more about others than we care for. But that's not easy to do. It's not easy to do because we tend to care for us. We can. And you know, with all the hurt, and all the stuff we carried on and everything. Now, as a church, what would happen if we all have the right tool? A tool? You know what that's called, Deborah? That's called revival. Because I want to take you to the last scripture that shows us revival. And it's found in Mark chapter 2. Can you put that on? And again, he entered Capernaum. Nazareth was where he was born. Nazareth, they didn't want him. But Capernaum is where Peter was. is right on the north side of the, the lake. And again he entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Right on. Next one. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Jesus opened up his toolbox, and he began to preach the word to them. The house was packed. We don't know what size of house. We don't know uh, very many things, but it just says the house was packed right to the door. Right to the door. And probably more people were listening and watching for the word of God. The word that set them free. Remember, he's anointed. He's set apart. He's chosen. Okay, next verse. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now we see another, it's all packed. Remember we did that one time here? We had Owen and four guys carrying somebody and we all packed the front door. He couldn't, they went outside, they couldn't come back. So they had to go upstairs and they had to come back over here. And by the time they got here, Owen was just, just, just I think we got the best of him. And Dave wasn't the one in the banquet, and he was all, you know, he was okay. But, but they carried, and you know, listen to the whole story. Four guys bringing this guy that's paralyzed. Take me to Jesus! Now! And you know what? Maybe he had four bodies that owe him a favor. We see that sometime, right? They, uh, you know, you owe me one favor, and you do that favor to me, and uh, you're free after. Or maybe it was a relationship, a uh, family, who knows, maybe it was friend. But this guy, take me to Jesus. They lay him on the couch, in the bed. They took him to Jesus. They heard, he's in town. He, 
locked in the house. They get to the house, the house is full. You can't even take a cart. You know, if you have that little thing trying to get into here and it's jam packed, you stay outside, lady, because you couldn't. And uh, they would go ahead the next. And when they could not come near him, they could not come near him. Because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was so that when they had broken through, they let him down the bed. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Next verse. When Jesus saw their faith. I, I like that because Jesus always says he always saw her faith. He always saw his faith. But there it says he saw their faith. Whose faith? The crippled guy and the four helper. They had faith. That's what we need as a tool. It's faith. That has always got to be there. Always in the toolbox. And if it's not in the pool, toolbox, get back. Make sure it's in there. Because somebody needs it. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And I don't know if he wanted to get even with the Pharisee and the Pharisee, but sin maybe caused this man peril. I'm not saying it's always the case, but in this case, maybe it was. Okay, next verse. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoned in their heart. Okay, next verse. Why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sin? God alone. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about your heart? Not in your mind. In their heart. Powerful is in their heart. Next verse. Which one is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Say, arise, pick up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has tool in his box here on earth, and he forgives sin. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, hope, arise, pick up your bed, and go to your house. Next verse. Immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God. Saying, We never saw anything like. See, the church has to come back where the people in the world says, We never seen anything like this before. I mean, a blind came in, he's healed. A marriage that was failing apart. I mean, they were at the lawyer's throat. Never mind their own throat. And, you know, they're in love again. We never saw anything like that before. If people begin to talk about you and said, you know what? We, Never seen them like that before. Something has happened. I know when we got saved, somebody said, Something has happened. You're not the same before. We never seen something that before. Because of a group of five people that would not take no for an answer, that would say, And you know what? They had tools. They, they had to drop this bed. I'm sure they didn't. It had to be a house at least that high. They didn't just drop the guy down there. They had to lower him with some, some rope or something. You know, he had a bed. I mean, he pick up your couch and uh, so, and you know, they pulled the roof apart, you know, with their bare hand. I don't know what they did. They had tools that they used with their faith to get to Jesus. Yes, thing that they wanted. The, wa the world, world, the world needs it. The world wants it, and the world is waiting for us.